I do want to ask uh, about your experience uh, working at uh, Badger and EBTC. Uh, I saw uh, recently you know, you've gone through a ton of audits, and many, many layers, and you were heavily involved in that process. Uh, can you sort of describe that process a bit? Yeah. So there's something, first of all, I'm going to say something meta about it, which is that like, it's always very hard to talk confidently about these things because if we were to get an exploit or we were to make a mistake, it's like, you know, the classic I told you so scenario. So I'm extremely not vocal about it in uh, like on Twitter or stuff because I feel like to brag about your security practices is like, uh, it just doesn't help. And uh, uh, so I, I don't know. But uh, in terms of what we did, um, first of all, we... Um, we have like a, 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 a fairly security focused culture at Badger. And the, the way we built that was when we launched, uh, uh, when I joined Badger, uh, they already had launched a bunch of uh, vaults, uh, mostly related to uh, WBTC and basically farming uh, tokens like on Curve, on Convex, stuff like that. And uh, they basically uh, had a bunch of people um, consulting them uh, as security researchers. And these were what you would call strategists. And so they were people that were connected to other yield farms. They had a complete understanding of how to gain yield, the risks related to that. And so they would offer consulting that way. And so this, is, this goes back to the idea that there are private consultants you will never hear about. They're doing their thing. They don't even call themselves SRs, but they exist. And so, and that was called, I think, the council, the Badger Council, the Security Council. And then I was part of the council uh, as a consultant and then uh, we basically didn't have enough support because we were making changes like every week uh, and we had to have more reviews. And so we started by hiring some more junior researchers, a couple of them, um, one of them joined Ave later, another one found a bug in Solidly for $200,000. So like people that are actually really smart and we all hired them through hackathons actually. We, I would basically, there's a few videos on YouTube of me explaining how to write a yield farm, a real strategy, People would submit their real strategy if they wrote really well and they had uh, security conscious processes. We would interview them and then give them some work and then eventually hire them. And then we created what is called the Badger Strategies repo, which should be actually open source. It's in the Badger uh, GitHub. But basically, the Badger Strategies repo was the process that we followed step by step to review the code base. Which what the first step was explaining back what the code does which goes against the idea of just saying it looks good to me. You actually have to explain to me what the code does so that we're sure we have the same agreement. And then you add more uh, banal stuff such as running the test or writing the test, checking for coverage, and then doing some security stuff, which at the time wasn't fully formalized uh, because there was code arena was nascent. Maybe there wasn't a code arena, so it wasn't clear. And so I guess through my involvement in code arena, I would take a bunch of the reports and put them and share them with the team. And we would have kind of a, like our own checklist of stuff to check. And then we realized that when we needed more uh, security reviews, we could do a contest. And that's where the CVX contest goes through. We did it in partnership with actually Convex. There was both a Badger pot and a Convex pot. And from that contest, the, the move, the alpha for a project was get the top uh, wardens and just talk to them privately and just offer them one-on-one -on -one engagements. And uh, uh, we had chats with multiple of these wardens. Uh, I'm proud to say that I worked with wardens when they basically were novices and I, was, and I knew they were killers. And so I would just work with them. And then once they, uh, you know, uh, the job got above their pay grade, they would just stop working with us because uh, they had other opportunities. But like, that's a way to find that talent. And so what we did with VBTC was we, we, we came into that project knowing about these practices internally and then we have an internal, uh, let's call it a, a second party, which will be like a separate uh, small shop that does reviews for us. And it's like, if you go on Colorina, you you probably know who they are. But like we have the top top researcher, in my opinion, I guess I'm going to shield them. It's Watchpug. We work with Watchpug. We just send them everything we change and uh, uh, we just send it to them. And then they send us reviews. And that's internally, again, we treat them as if they were part of the team. So every PR they review, every merge they review, so that we get all of that uh, granular feedback. And then once we have enough of a code base and we have a, a project, we go with the external audit. In the case, we published it uh, 
yesterday, we had the trust uh, uh, team do the first uh, uh, audit. Uh, and then uh, we fixed those bugs. We still had some of the spec uh, that was unfinished. So there's some discussion as to whether we should have done that audit that early because of uh, some, some really interesting, like once we open source the code, you'll see some really interesting stuff with smart contract wallets where I built what I call the diamond like, uh, which is basically a uh, noses uh, contract where instead of putting the storage in, uh, in line, you just put it as a diamond pattern. And then you have delegate calls that allow uh, callbacks. So basically it's a smart contract wallet that allows flash loans or it actually allows custom signatures from custom colors. It's like pretty, pretty interesting uh, low level stuff. But basically I had to shore that in, code it in two weeks and just send it and they basically broke it and they found a bunch of stuff because I, again, I was rushed to just get that done. And then um, after that we fixed it and then we did an audit with Spearbit. And then uh, we're currently in this phase where we're going through some mitigation because of some stuff that we'll eventually open source uh, or sorry, we'll, uh, we'll disclose. But that, that is actually almost related to this uh, model of having this type of CDPs, having sorted, uh, sorted lists, etc. And so um, that, that's kind of the audit phase. And to, to me, at least, the audit is something that helps you improve the code on one level if there's like some architectural issues. So arguably, we should have done that earlier so that we, we, they were more part of the design phase. And then as you uh, fix stuff, you do audits as a way to ensure that the, the, the bar is met. The, the tests are there, the code works as spec, and it works. And then something we do, we done later was we build, uh, we did invariant testing. We worked with Antonio. Uh, uh, we're going to release a podcast soon about what we did with Antonio Vigiano. And basically, we built all of these invariants. We've been running them for months, basically. And every time we make a change, we rerun it to make sure that it's compatible. And so that all allowed us to add some uh, tweaks later uh, while maintaining that confidence that it was going to work. And then now at this point, we're going to basically wrap everything up, finish the documentation. I know we're going to get like the bot findings from Codarin are going to be this long of all the, you know, the to do left in the code, the, 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 cause that's just how a project works. It's like, why would I spend a day rewriting that if my code doesn't, uh, if my code has critical bugs, that's my focus not the non-critical stuff. And so, but once we're done with that, we'll do the Codorina contest, and then we're gonna open source the fuzzing setup so that we can have people just run it independently. And we're gonna do a guarded launch where as the guarded launch goes, you're gonna be able to submit coded proof of concepts and you're gonna have like a bug bounty that grows. And then I believe because of the fact that we cannot uh, undo EBTC, it's like, it's actually, Unless, like, even if Chainlink stops working, the uh, EBTC is just going to report the last price and people are going to be able to operate it. So it's like, it's actually, we cannot block it, we cannot pause it, it's actually, actually immutable. So we'll probably do an exponential back bounty where towards the end it's higher so that we have like a stop to stop it. But once it's, uh, the back bounty is over, we're just going to release it and it's, there's not even going to be a back bounty, it's just going to be like done. We're going to use the money for the bug bounties like insurance where we insure up to that amount. And that's all we can do because again, we cannot take it back. So all of the work we're doing, we're doing it early to avoid preventing those extreme scenarios later because the, we will not have a mitigation at that point. Our plan is just going to be to have macros to allow people to withdraw fast, having like a one click D lever, close your position instantly, make sure it's on IPFS, it's decentralized and you can use it uh, even if the site is DDoSed, but at the same time, we had to do all of the work early. And so to summarize, internal review, internal audits, audits, contests, and then bug bounties. And that's how we, we try to do the most complete cheese model possible to make sure that nothing was missed. And if something was missed, it's not going to be life ruining uh, outcomes. It's just going to be like a rounding error and we're going to have like a chewy CDP that is going to be there for insurance and uh, uh, nothing bad is going to happen from that. Mm, that's an uh, incredible security process. I, probably the most thorough that I've ever seen in this space. Um, did any of those reviews or processes, uh, did any of those steps surprise you or turn up with anything that you didn't expect? Yeah. I, I think uh, 
And uh, maybe one day you should invite up, uh, which is uh, effectively the technical lead at uh, Badger. And I think uh, the the, in, the most interesting discussion we, we either will have, uh, but perhaps in a different podcast, is when do you burn everything and rewrite it from zero? That's like the that's like the main question that happens to every project, every startup ever. It's like, and I'm gonna just give you like my theory, which is based on uh, a video from Ars Technica called War Stories, and it's the story of Crash Bandicoot. And basically, my theory is that like to do something at the world star level, a world class level, you need to basically do it three times because the first time you're doing something that is revolutionary, go and check uh, the story from. Uh, um, uh, from Crash Bandicoot, it's an incredible story about how he, he basically was able to use the CD-ROM to have 64 times the memory. He was able to create all of these uh, animation by compressing them through a custom compressor. And so the same thing is for us, like I had to write Python simulation after simulation to be able to determine the risk levels and determine the type of uh, uh, whether like uh, a certain primo will cause CDPs to go underwater. We had to create a different mechanism for recovery mode by allowing what we call the grace period, where there's a delay in time and there's like a full research about the Ethereum consensus, reorgs, the economic costs and MEV to determine why the grace period is that duration. And so it's like it's rabbit hole after rabbit hole. But once you're done with the first version, you can see all of the imperfection. You can see the crap, basically. And, uh, but you also know that for, for us to basically rewrite from scratch, is going to increase the surface area, the attack surface by so much because it's gonna invalidate all of the previous work. And so it's always a very difficult decision uh, of when do you basically kill it and rebuild it or where do you just stick with it? And so this is the world, I guess this is the world in which in uh, let's say June of this year, we didn't kill it and we just kept it. And so you're gonna see that he still uses the linked list. There is no Merkle proof for the linked list, which is something really interesting that could have been done to compress all the gas and all that stuff. Uh, because ultimately, uh, we, uh, in spite of the criticism of the design, uh, we, we basically, it's like, a, it's like a ugly building. We placed all of the bombs that we cooled and it withstand and it's still alive. And so we're like, bro, we're not building a better one. We're just keeping this one because it survived all of those attacks. And so that's kind of the philosophy that we went there. Uh, and again, we, we are fully aware that we can't take it back. And that was the point because EVTC was born from uh, uh, SBF uh, rugging a lot of people because Badger was also actually a token on, uh, on uh, FTX as well. And then um, ran closing because once FTX rugged, basically was shut down, we realized that REN from REN BTC had all of their money on uh, FTX. And I'm not, I, I don't have enough information to have like a sophisticated opinion, but my understanding is SBF failing caused REN BTC to fail because the majority of the server were there, the keys were there, and nobody was able to basically use REN. And now people are telling me that REN still works or some, some stuff, I still don't get it. But like the... Um, the fact that the most decentralized token was shut down by FTX is the reason why EBTC exists. It's because we actually were like, bro, let's build something with its flaws because you can criticize that it's not real Bitcoin or whatever, but let's build something that it cannot be stopped and that it works no matter what. That's the entire point of building a primitive. So let's build a real primitive, not a Mickey Mouse primitive. Mm. Nice, nice. I, I mean, I'm always saying that DeFi these days, we don't really have real primitives. Yeah, it's pretty incredible that you're building something like this. Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, I, again, I look at it from a um, almost uh, like, you know, again, World of Warcraft point of view, that it's like, uh, it was like a, the, there was the economic puzzle of giving the MEV incentives, the right incentives to make sure the system works. There's the interesting UX of allowing delegation. We added like this really interesting dynamic where you can have a zap and then if it's a trusted zap, at the end of the zap, the zap can actually deny its own allowance so that basically it resets, so that you know that a good zap will do something and then it will rescind instead of keeping the allowance so that you can actually have the revoke done by them instead of by you so that you're safe by default. We had the smart contract wallet as one of the designs that we had the delegation as another design. And then uh, we, uh, 
there's also like a, from an economic point of view, it's a very interesting idea because you're basically trading the flippening, which is actually, it's actually really rational. Like if you go and watch what people do on Aave, they basically deposit WST if and they borrow if and then they swap the if for WST if and uh, uh, they basically trade uh, levered uh, yield on if. And some people that are a little more risky, they use WBTC as collateral and then they borrow if and swap it to WST if and basically do the same loop. And so effectively what they're doing is they're saying that the beta of the market will grow. They're going to get the ST yield, which means that you get the staking yield in a levered way. So you don't get, you know, two, three percent. You actually get something more interesting. And then at the same time, they're playing the, the, um, the delta between Bitcoin and the ETH with the assumption that ETH will rise. So I believe it has some, uh, uh, like it's basically like the second most interesting thing you will do as a, uh, let's say, capital allocator. Uh, but that said, even from a purely technical uh, point of view, it was it was extremely uh, engaging as a project. And uh, uh, my main uh, ambition there is that in open sourcing the code and open sourcing the research, this is going to uh, help uh, level that up because I can speak for myself in terms of what I will do better, basically, is I will do, uh, I have the ability now of building tools that allow to Estimate the systemic risk, uh, the, the, the upwards DPEG, which is an interesting phenomenon that happens with stable coins is as liquidations happen, the price raises because more people are doing liquidations and they don't want to take the debt. And so you, you like, I feel like because of the, again, the multi cyclicality of the skills where you have the front end, the UX, uh, the security, the economy and the, uh, um, the smart contracts you can actually like, uh, I mean, I, at least I can build uh, visualization tools or tools that help uh, better understand that. And in doing that, uh, I believe we are basically putting the, the conversation forward in terms of what stable coins are and how they should be built and how they can offer guarantees that are not uh, um, enforced by people, but they're actually enforced by code.